My name is Richard Giuliani. I've been a member of the sociology department at this university since the late 1970s. Uh, and um, I'm here to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, but also to welcome you to the fourth annual lecture in the Manila Lecture Series, uh, due to, which is due to uh, the great affection and generosity to this university of Mr. Alfred Manella, who is usually here with us for these uh, presentations but cannot be tonight. Um, but the lecture series is named in honor of his parents, uh, Alfred F. and uh, uh, what's his, his mother's name was Rose T. Manella, Alfred F. F. and Rose T. Manella, uh, the Manella Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, I have been studying uh, uh, Italian immigration to America and the Italian experience in America for over 40 years now. And uh, this is what drew me into uh, acquaintance and more than acquaintance of strong friendship with Joan. Uh, and uh, I was very enthusiastic about the possibility of having her give our program tonight. Um, during the 30 years that I spent teaching at this university, uh, I tried to introduce some courses that were germane to this kind of subject matter. Uh, one was on Italian immigration to America. The other was on Italy as a modern society. Uh, and we had uh, great enthusiastic experiences for the semester that I taught each of these two courses over the years. Uh, and then I found out that I couldn't teach them any longer because the department uh, that I was in had other priorities and uh, the opportunity was no longer being uh, offered. Um, and I think uh, many of our departments have other bread and butter uh, priorities that require certain conventional, more traditional courses be offered. Uh, and we don't get to do as much of this kind of thing as some of us would like to. So um, I, I, in my years here, I've had some very special disappointments because of our inability to uh, provide this kind of thing for our students and for the community. Uh, and uh, especially because we have very obviously a very natural constituency in our student body because there are so many Italian-American students here. It's a natural kind of thing that we do this. Uh, the upshot of all of this is that the lecture series has become something, the Manella lecture series is something that is very dear to my heart because it enables us to do a little bit of this sort of thing. It affords the opportunity to offer programs that deal with areas um, of which our ordinary courses uh, do not uh, deal with, do not allow. Um, the first program in this lecture series three years ago, uh, I uh, gave the first presentation, which was on a recent book I had finished uh, on the first Italian church in the United States, uh, St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi. And the, um, the 56 year career of an extraordinary pastor uh, Monsignor Antonio Isolari, who led that particular uh, uh, adventure. Um, two, uh, uh, two years ago, we were fortunate enough to have uh, Donato Di Simone, uh, who many of you know, I think, who himself is a Villanova University graduate and who was a former teacher of Italian here and had recently completed a book called Suffer the Children, uh, which uh, described his experiences growing up in Italy during the Second World War. A very uh, moving, poignant, and important kind of book. And uh, Danny De Simone gave us the presentation on that particular occasion. Last year, we were very fortunate in our third program, one year ago, to have Professor Nick Petruno, who had recently uh, uh, re retired uh, after serving many years uh, as a member of the um, faculty of the Italian program at Bryn Mawr College and had been the director of the Italian program in fact and had recently, not a few years before, had completed a, a book based on his research on uh, Primo Levi, uh, one of the great, truly great scholars and writers of modern Italy. And tonight we turn to my dear friend Joan Savarino who continues uh, this tradition. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm very happy uh, that uh, we have her because she is, uh, not only because she's the first woman, perhaps long overdue to have a woman speaker in this series, uh, but I think her work uh, beautifully uh, continues uh, the tradition that we have established uh, along these lines. 
Let me uh, give you some background information on Joan. Uh, her bachelor's degree came from West Virginia University in anthropology and sociology, followed by a master's degree from George Washington University in anthropology, and finally a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in the program of folklore and folk life. Uh, she is currently an adjunct professor uh, in the sociology, anthropology, criminal justice department uh, at Arcadia University and in the Italian studies program at the University of Pennsylvania. She is a distinguished a scholar, distinguished teacher, who was also very recently the director of education at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, where she established a very pioneering undertaking, the much very greatly acclaimed uh, Philip Place Project, uh, which is just an extraordinary undertaking that uh, uh, has had a great impact, I think, on public history in Philadelphia. Uh, when I first uh, chatted with Joan about the possibility that we might be able to have her, I had a little bit of a dilemma because um, Joan is a Renaissance woman and I wasn't sure whether I wanted to urge her to talk about the great uh, research that she had uh, done uh, in other areas. Uh, she has taught me a great deal about uh, uh, one e moment in history that has been very important on her uh, particular agenda, uh, and that is uh, the great mining disaster in Monongah, West Virginia in 1907, which was the greatest industrial disaster I think ever in American industrial history at this point, which most of the, most of the victims were Italian uh, miners, and uh, Joan is the person you go to when you want to learn about the Menanga mining disaster. Uh, or whether it was going to be on her research on the Italian communities in Germantown and Chestnut Hill, or her research and writing on the Italian community in Reading, Pennsylvania, all of which has been superb work, or whether it would be on the needlework by Calabrian women, both in Italy and the United States, which uh, turned out to be the option that she has chosen to exercise for us tonight. But uh, once again, in presenting Joan, what really delights me about um, having her here is that she, like uh, some of our other, uh, all, I think all of our other presenters in the past, um, is uh, filling a unique niche that I think we need to hear more of. It's part of our history. Uh, it's the kind of thing that is often overlooked or ignored. Uh, and I think after you hear Joan, you will understand with a new appreciation uh, why and how in so many ways it is an important moment in both Italian and American social history. Joan, where are you? What happened to her? Oh. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight, and I'd also like to thank uh, Alfred Manella, who could not be here tonight, uh, for establishing this series and my opportunity to talk, and uh, Rich Giuliani for his ongoing friendship and support, and for uh, Gina McFadden's work in uh, allowing me to set up tonight and present. So. Um, my talk tonight is sort of a mix of scholarly and public. I knew it would be a mix of people, and I think it is. Um, I invite you uh, at some point when the reception begins to come up and look at the needlework that I've brought in. And then uh, Richard Kala, who's sitting in the front here, has a, a beautiful uh, bedspread that his grandmother, I believe, is that right? Grandmother uh, crocheted. Uh, that's in the window, and you should read the story. It's a, I just read the story. It's a beautiful story about how she uh, uh, took on the, the work of making that bedspread. Um, and so I invite you to come up and look. There are three things on the table I just want to mention. They do have tags. Um, some of it is the work of my great-grandmother, which you will um, hear about her tonight. This on this end of the table is done by Rosina Iaconis, who I interviewed when I did work in San Giovanni in Fiore in Calabria, which is my great-grandmother's hometown, and I'll talk about. And then uh, one piece there uh, on the far end, this piece, 
is just an example uh, of work by Carmela Matza, who uh, is also lives in the Sila and is a weaver and an embroiderer in the town of Longobuco. And I brought that because I wanted you to get an idea of how different the traditions can be in different towns. Um, and this is a book about Carmela written by her son uh, to get his degree at the University of Calabria, and then a book about San Giovanni and Fiore. So I, I invite you to come up here and see those. Um, the talk I'm gonna give tonight is adapted from a longer article uh, that will be published in an edited book entitled Stitches in Air, Women's Domestic Needlework from the Italian D Diaspora, which is forthcoming from the University of Mississippi Press. Um, it's also part of a book manuscript that I'm writing, and uh, um, the research uh, this, that I'm presenting tonight was supported by a National Endowment for the Arts grant in uh, 1981, and then a Giovanni Agnelli Fellowship to go back to San Giovanni and Fiore. Um, before I begin the actual talk, I just want to comment about the talk and about my larger research project. Um, my work expands the growing uh, a body of research that challenges the stereotypical and reductionist notions of Italian and Italian immigrant, uh, uh, immigrant women that prevailed before feminist scholarship began to analyze women's roles and gender relations. I should say this is not on. Do you, can people hear me back there? Oh, it is on. Okay, great. Am I yelling? Because <laughs> I can do that. Um, yet technologies of the everyday uh, and their embeddedness in social relations has still been sorely underexplored and undervalued in, a, in the Italian diasporic context. My research uh, intends to fill this lacuna by examining the importance of such everyday aesthetic practices, um, tonight that of dom domestic needlework is what I'm talking about, uh, in social life. It also seeks to shed light on Italian immigrant communities and women's lived experience in Appalachia, both of which are virtually unknown. Anthropologist Kathleen Stewart has called West Virginia a doubly occupied landscape occupation by the coal industry, as well as by the people who lived there. We know that Italian immigrants' adaptation to life in the U United States was place-specific, yet little research exists that explores the uniqueness of Italian life, formation of identity, and the transnational connections between West Virginia and the home paese. I have been convinced of the importance of this work for a very long time and am grateful tonight to be able to present it to a local audience uh, tonight here at Villanova. Can we, can you turn off the lights or down? Ana Huaracio Peluso emigrated from San Giovanni in Fiore in Calabria, Italy at the age of 24 in 1915 to join her husband who was already working in the coal fields in north central West Virginia. Anna, the sole member of her family to emigrate, would spend the rest of her life in various coal camps. She would return to her hometown only once after a 60-year absence. Anna thought of herself as a maestrina, a teacher of embroidery, but it was only during the last 10 years of her life that her family and the community would see her skills and then begin to think of her as a ricamatrice, an embroiderer. Anna was my maternal great-grandmother, the family matriarch. She was diminutive, <coughs> under five feet, but was known for her outgoing and independent personality, her flexibility, her excellent memory, her wisdom, and a warm and generous heart. These appealing personal qualities kept her home a revolving door of family and friends of all ages, and were crucial to her survival over a difficult lifetime. I, as did many of my cousins, loved to visit Anna at her home. And she was the stereotypical <coughs> indulgent grandmother whose home and yard could be explored unfettered by parents' scrutiny. When I was an anthropology student in the mid-1970s at West Virginia University, a life history assignment 
added a new professional dimension to my close relationship with Anna. I began to interview her and discovered that she had had a reputation in Italy as an expert, Ricamatrice. I continued to interview her sporadically to a few days uh, before her death in 1988, or a few months before her death in 1988. In 1991, under the auspices of the Giovanni and Yelly Fellowship, I was able to continue the research I'd begun in West Virginia, uh, for three, and I went there for three months. I interviewed old women who were my great-grandmother's contemporaries. It was a re revelatory research endeavor. In working with many years with my great-grandmother and then in her hometown, where I was introduced by my cousins, I enjoyed somewhat of an insider status. I have tried with this work to situate myself in the text, acknowledging the hybrid and position nature of the research that involves my own life experiences as both granddaughter and ethnographer. In San Giovanni in 1991, I am sitting beside Rosina, seen here in costume, both of us warming our feet in front of her open hearth, the only source of heat in her house on Via Archi, a stone's throw from San Giovanni in Fiore's 12th century center, the Abbazia Giochino. The recent arrival of cool November air is only a hint of the frigidity that will soon come to this town. That's perched between Cosenza and Catanzaro in the mountainous Sila Grande region of Calabria. Rosina sends me to the small wooden armoire in her bedroom. When I open those doors, it is as if her life history as a ricamatrice, an embroiderer, comes spilling out. There lies a traditional costume, carefully wrapped, newly sewn, unworn, waiting for her funeral and burial. There are parts of a lifetime of costumes, some too old, some too small now, but none discarded. In the bottom of the closet, stacked, rolled, encased in plastic, are exquisite examples of inculorate, the two pieces of embroidered linen at the neck of the traditional, worn at the neck of the traditional costume that Rosina has salvaged. These are Rosina's hopes, dreams, and memories written in thread, waiting, waiting to be deciphered. As I carry the incolorate into Ro Rosina, she lovingly holds each piece, reciting the old Calabrian names for the designs. <laughs> this trove is Rosina's gold. It is her personal identity, her legacy, her cultural legacy. In that moment, the yards of fabric before me, I can see more clearly the parallels between Rosina's life and the art she produced and that of Ana Huarashio Peluso, my great-grandmother, who is the main subject of this paper. Opening the armoire, I feel time tumbling, filled with the history of the commonplace, the minutia of San Giovanese women's lives, daily domestic lives, thoughts, and feelings, never fully knowable. In these artifacts is, collected, is located a collective cultural memory. How do we begin to interpret how people make sense of the past? One method is to begin with accounts of lived experience. In this talk, I explore the intersections of needlework, gender, creativity, narrative and memory in one immigrant woman's extraordinary life in two out-of-the-way places, Calabria and Appalachia. At the end of Anna's life, narrative and embroidery merged to produce one last project, returning to the, the ricamo, the needlework, that she had learned as a young girl but had abandoned during the middle years of her life. She wove stitches as well as stories. For the elderly immigrant, Reminiscence is an es essential aspect of the process that Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimlet calls self-integration. Barbara Meyerhoff notes that the construction of a coherent experience of I, a sense of continuity with one's past selves, is not inevitable. It must be actively sought 
and maintained by examining, selecting, interpreting, and connecting elements from one's inner and outer history. Reminiscence should be regarded as a major developmental task for the elderly, resulting in the integration that will allow them to age well and die well. For the elderly artist, it is the acquisition of the traditional art form during childhood that facilitates the process of integrating a long, varied life into a coherent one. The role objects play in the expressive life of the elderly has often been overlooked, as Kirschenblatt Gimlet tells us. In Anna's case, a narrated life review or reminiscence and the art of needlework became, became an inextricably linked method for Anna to establish coherence or accomplish coherence. Anna was born in 1890 and Rosina in 1905, a 15 year difference, but in terms of details of their early lives and the cultural and social economy of San Giovanni, they were contemporaries. Anna's life, however, diverged from Rosina's in one life altering way. Anna emigrated from San Giovanni while Rosina remained. Rosina, 86 years old, here in 1991 when I was doing research with her, no longer embroidered because of failing eyesight due to diabetes. But her mind was active, as was Anna's almost up until her death, a few days short of her 98th birthday. For both these women, reminiscence had become a life-sustaining activity. In Anna's case, however, as Kirschenblatt Gimlet notes, is the situation for the elderly immigrant. Emigration was a life-rupturing activity severing the continuity of life such that reminiscence became an activity that really was essential to personal and cultural survival. To understand Anna and the role the embroidery played at life's end, it is essential to understand the role, its role in her youth and to locate both her and the embroidery in their temporal and cultural context. Anna's early life illustrates the conditions of a struggling, non-land-holding Calabrian family at the turn of the century. A closer look at its dimensions will shed light on the interplay of individual agency and the constraints of social structure in Anna's life. San Giovanni in Fiore is 1,100 uh, meters above sea level in the province of Cosenza, as I said before. It is the oldest and has remained the most populous commercial center of the mountainous Sila Grande since Blessed Joachino built an abbey there in the 12th century. Francesco Malegrana described the economy of the town as based on agriculture, sheep rearing, and the traditional arts well into the post-World War II era. The details of Anna's early family history are typical of the micro and macro economic and social forces that buffet human lives. From at least the time of Anna's father's youth, the family was caught in the migratory pattern of moving in search of work that prevailed in Southern Italy during this period. This was a survival strategy to cope with poverty and the worsening economic crisis both in Italy and in the world. When Anna was about 10 years old, Still unable to find adequate employment after moving his family at least three times in search of work. Salvatore, her father, a stonemason, emigrated to the United States, settling in Utica, New York. He wrote and sent money sporadically. Like many of the women left behind, Anna's mother, Fulvia, was left to support herself and the five children she now had. She tried to succeed in this task by using her accomplished textile production skills. Fulvia was a weaver and owned a loom that dominated her rented one-room space. Before the introduction of commercially produced cloth, all women, in order to marry, had to know how to weave. In addition to weaving for her family's needs, Volvia provided goods to the local elite as a way to supplement the family's income. The Baracco family owned the largest agricultural estate, or Latifondo, in Calabria that encompassed San Giovanni. Payment was in kind, often in the form of foodstuffs, stuffs, and many owed debt to the Latifondo. 
In this area, er everyone in San Giovanni was dependent on handmade goods, since few manufactured goods reached the region, characterized by its mountainous terrain, severe winter weather, and poor roads. Because of its relative isolation, cultural, social, and economic changes that were occurring elsewhere in Italy at a faster pace came more slowly to the Sila. Accessibility to a major transportation networks were non-existent until the first railroad line linking Cosenza located in the valley and San Giovanni was completed at the late date of 1950. Passage during the winter months when ice and snow blocked roads, a frequent occurrence even today, was impossible. The first telephone line was installed in 1955. In contrast to her mother, Anna never had her hand at the loom. She learned to crochet and knit in an early age from her mother and two other women. Anna estimated she completed school up to the end of the fourth grade when her mother insisted she quit. A teacher and the principal intervened and her mother relented with the stipulation that she had to knit one half of one stocking before she left every morning for school. At this point, Anna was already assisting her mother to meet the demands of Fulvia's commission work. Anna continued to attend school for four or five more months under this arrangement. When she was about 14, Anna began taking lessons in a class with other girls to learn the particular embroidery patterns known as collectively known as tornise, used on the, on the incolorata, the two pieces of embroidered uh, linen that I mentioned sit at the neck, yoke, here you can see on Anna, uh, barely, you'll see a picture better later, at the collar of the traditional costume. The embroidery, both drawn work and cut work, was done with undyed thread on natural or bleached linen, spun and woven by San Juanese. Anna's skill was soon so expert that her mother engaged her to embroider for other girls' trousseau. Because of Anna's talent, the eldest daughter, Costanza, was given most of the housework. Anna could now keep her hands clean for the time-consuming task of embroidering white on white linen. Anna's training in embroidery, as opposed to her mother's in weaving, is indicative of the growing importance of Biancaria, hand-embroidered white wear in a girl's trousseau. By the end of the 19th century, according to Jane Schneider, Biancaria, or Letti, which literally means beds, as the sets of Biancaria were called, had become the primary component of trousseau. Biancaria was a key symbol of social position, linked with the concept of female honor and the preferred form of stored wealth in southern Italy. These linens weren't necessarily used. Why this occurred is complex. In fact, they weren't used for the most part. Why this occurred, it was stored wealth. Why this occurred is complex, but for the purposes here, it is important to note it because of its ramifications for cultural values as well as women's production. Although girls in wealthy families learned to embroider, embroidery exemplified purity and social status, the huge trousseau that was bestowed upon these wealthy girls required an outsourcing of the work. That's a word we hear a lot these days. Outsourcing to the likes of Anna and her cohorts. Thus, these girls from less fortunate families filled a particular economic niche. Their families tried to emulate the fashions and desires of the elite by training their daughters in the art of embroidery, competing in the village rivalry for social status. Their school skills were not learned primarily to mark leisure status, however, as was the situation for girls in better off families. While these girls embroidered for their own small trousseau, they were also pressed into service to produce biancaria for the elite to aid their own family's economic survival. In short, the conflation of female production with reproduction is complicated further when production is done at the hands of unmarried girls essentially in the servitude of others. In the trousseau of a San Giovanese woman, both the traditional peasant costume and bed linens were expensive and symbolic. A long discussion of the social role of regional peasant dress and its change over time is not within the scope of this talk. 
Suffice it to say that regional dress differed from town to town and served as a visual, visual identifier of place and located the, the wearer as to his social identity in terms of gender, age, social status, occupation, ritual occasion, and religion. Peasant dress overall served to de-individualize the wearer. In San Giovanni, as late as the end of World War II, the peasant dress was donned upon marriage and worn daily by women of the working classes, wives of laborers, artisans, or small businessmen. And as late as 10 or so years ago, they could be seen in San Giovanni. <coughs> by the early 20th century, women of the upper classes had already adopted fashionable dress. Now, uh, Italians in Italy were largely unaware that there was a town, one or two towns in the early 1990s, 1980s, where women wore traditional dress, the entire costume, as you see here, on a daily basis. These women donned the dress before World War II and swore to war and wore it until they died, unless for doctor's reasons sometimes because of health, because the corset was tight, they w the doctors made them take it off. But you could, now they're all gone as of about 10 years ago. Although girls began to wear a simplified version of the costume after first menstruation, indicating their willingness to marry, the rituartu, the head covering of white linen, adorning a distinctive hairstyle, was only worn upon marriage. The San Giovanese Pacchiane, as the woman, women in traditional dress are known, say that without the rituartu, and this San Giovanese uh, language is very difficult, I'm not pronouncing it correct. One is without womanhood. The costumed body is an embodiment not merely of the gendered self, but of its relationship to the idea of the honorable woman. The color white, the white head covering, white on white embroidered bed linens, encoded the concept of female purity, an important Mediterranean behavioral code. The marriage bed itself, bedecked with trousseau linens, also embodied the symbolism of female purity, for the bride must be a virgin. In dictating virginal marriage as the proper path for a woman, such cultural codes enabled her to fulfill her designated role as a virtuous good woman and mother. The white on white embroidery symbolically reinforced these values. Especially for younger girls, the embroidery played a primary role in social life. Female lives were circumscribed, their activities restricted by moral codes. To break the monotony of long hours spent doing handwork, girls embroidered in groups, a way for them to gather and socialize. Anna often spoke of the laughter and gossip she enjoyed when spending time in the company of other girls. In this way, the social component became an impetus for the work. At the same time, the embroideries were inscribed with the memories of a social life once shared with others. In southern Italy, the female labor was primarily unpaid and linked to domestic activities. The production of white ware was a respectable avenue for the Warashio women to actually supplement the family income. It was also essential. With the emigration of men, women were forced to work even harder to subsist. In general, women had to produce cloth and clothing for themselves, care for garden plots, plots, do laundry, and prepare food. The money that immigrant men sent back to their families was used to repay debt or buy property. It was not used for daily use, for daily living. As Fulvia's case demonstrates, women whose husbands had left experienced multiple anxieties, both economic and social, with men no longer around to protect the family honor. Wives were looked at suspiciously by other villagers because they no longer fit defined social roles. In the popular imagination and supported by medical writings of the time, women without men to control their sexuality would become voracious and were therefore suspect. Fulvia not only had to worry about her own reputation, she also had to worry about that of her two unmarried daughters. Getting her daughters married was a clear way to mitigate economic pressures and simultaneously solve the issue of protecting purity. Domenico Peluso 
had returned to San Giovanni from, the West, from West Virginia where he had been working in the coal mines. Domenico's father had died when he was two years old, and so at age 15 he had joined his older brother Andy in West Virginia. Their mother lived across the street from Anna's family, and Anna reported, he saw me and he just was crazy for me. It was not a marriage Anna sought. In fact, she always talked about the other boyfriends she had. But it was one arranged by her mother. Returning immigrants from America were considered good matches because they held the promise of economic stability. On February 2, 1908, Anna's adult life and the path toward her own eventual emigration began when she married Domenico. They first went to the courthouse for a civil ceremony, as Italians do today, and then to the church, known affectionately as Chiesa Madre, or Mother Church. According to Anna, when her father found out that Fulvia had arranged her in marriage, he finally broke off contact altogether, using the excuse that he did not approve of the marriage because Anna was too young. In fact, she was 18, the age that was considered ideal. At some point, the family discovered that Salvatore had married and started a second family in Utica, New York, giving rise to the family's belief that this was the real reason he had severed relations. After Anna emigrated, she tried to contact her father, but he never responded. In November of 1908, just nine months after her wedding, Anna gave birth to her first child, Caterina, seen here, my grandmother. When Domenico, and she's holding Tommaso, when Domenico was drafted and sent to fight in the Italo-Turkish War uh, of 1911-12, and then later when he immigrated once again for West, left once again for West Virginia, Anna was left alone. Faced now with a situation similar to her own mother's, Anna tried to support herself with her needlework skills. In addition to emphasizing her contribution to supporting her family, Anna's narratives about the embroidery served to reinforce her cleverness, as well as her formidable reputation as an expert at her craft. Anna related that during Domenico's absence, an envoy for King Vittorio Emanuele arrived in San Giovanni to collect needlework samples, and she was referred to him as the best ricamatrice in town. When he requested that Anna supply two cutwork samples in one week, an impossible task, she employed another woman to make one of the samples. Anna said that the envoy paid her 10 lira for each piece. After two and a half years, Domenico sent Anna the fair to join him. Anna brought only one small bag of personal belongings with her. Domenico had instructed her that everything she would need could be purchased in America. Before leaving, she gave her wedding jewelry kept in families uh, in San Giovanni to this day and guarded carefully her traditional costume and her biancaria to her family. What was done with that, we don't know. Trousseau was the primary component of a woman's dowry, and these items were often the most valuable possession she owned. Anna's shedding of the traditional costume and the dispersal of her corredo could only have been a traumatic event. In leaving a culture of mutually understood norms, one in which her role and status as a woman was unquestioned, Anna's disrobing was powerfully symbolic of a rupture of personhood as a result of cultural and temporal displacement. Anna and her children arrived at Ellis Island on May 1, 1915. Her final destination was Coons Run, a small rural coal mining camp in Marion County in north central West Virginia. Sorry, I get choked up sometimes. Where Domenica was working. Anna had to send a telegram to her husband so that he would meet her at the train station when she arrived in the town of Fairmont, the county seat. Once the family was reunited in Fairmont, they boarded a streetcar to Everson where the track ended. From there they walked to Coons Run, a distance of about one mile. The family lived with Domenico's brother Andy and his wife Sally in their four-room camp house. In her thick accent, Anna said, I left my mother, I left my brothers, everything. Andy was mean, 
Sally was me. My whole family agrees it's true. I never liked it very much. After several months, Andy and his wife moved to Fairmont, leaving the house to Domenico and Anna. I actually remember Sally, and she was mean to me, too. Her emotional losses and the culture shock she experienced threw her into the depths of depression for months. Anna said that for a long time, she longed to return to Italy. She had entered an Ap American Appalachian culture in which she was a stranger, socially and culturally isolated. West Virginia had harsh winter weather and a mountainous landscape to which Anna was accustomed, but it was characterized by a rural isolation and an industrial rhythm that was unfamiliar. In San Giovanni, she had many women friends, and the numerous Catholic churches offered them sanctioned social opportunities. The co closest Catholic church from Coons Run was in Mononga, a distance of about six miles, and where the worst mine disaster in U.S. history occurred in December 1907. A wealthy friend in San Giovanni had offered to pay Anna fare to return to Italy if she was still unhappy after five years. She said she could not manage, however, because she had the children and Domenico preferred the United States. Anna's unhappiness eased as she got to know the one other Italian family living in Coons Run with whom she became lifelong <coughs> friends. She also said, quote, the American people were pretty nice. Everybody liked me after I could talk a little bit. After I could talk, I had lots of friends. Anna was blessed with a positive nature, which aided her adjustment to the brutal life in cold camps. Not so true for many women. Um, <clears throat> Anna was one of many thousands of immigrants who arrived in West Virginia during this period. Between 1900 and 1920, the coal boom was the greatest it has ever been. Mine operators began actively recruiting southern blacks and immigrants to fill the void of workers. Of the bituminous coal fields, West Virginia attracted the largest proportion of foreign-born workers. Coal was the dominant industry that drew Italians to Marion County, and by 1923 it had over 1,153 Italian coal miners, one of the largest in the state. Between 1908 and 1935, the largest percentage, or 43%, of the 1,251 Italians who applied for citizenship in Marion County were from Calabria, and one-third of those were from only two towns in Calabria, one of them being San Giovanni. It was a typical chain migration pattern. The Tri-City area of Fairmont, Clarksburg, and Morgantown drew huge numbers of San Giovanni. While these figures imply a similar settlement pattern, to the urban enclaves of the cities where infrastructure networks existed by the early 20th century. This was not the case. The mining towns where Italians resided were spread throughout the rural county, and therefore Italians were not able to form beneficial associations that existed in urban areas where large concentrations of Italians lived together. Italians and immigrants in general were still a minority in the American-born population, and were regarded with suspicion and often discriminated against, not an unusual story. Known in West Virginia as coal camps, these were company towns. The mine owners dictated the camp names, the architecture, the layout of the camps themselves, and segregated them along class and ethnic lines. Housing and work assignments were hierarchical too, with the best going to American-born whites, then immigrants, and African Americans getting the worst treatment. Miners were forced to rent the spare housing which was built and maintained by the coal companies. During the 1920s, Dominic, Domenico became involved in union strikes, and the Palusos, along with other union activists, were forced to move out of the company houses into union barracks. There, these were no more than crude shacks without any insulation to protect the families from the bitter winter cold. In stark contrast to the cheaply constructed miners' housing was Highgate, the grand mansion built by James Watson, son of James O. Watson, known as the father of the West Virginia coal industry. It's now a funeral home, owned by an Italian, fittingly. <laughs> he hired the Philadelphia Victorian architect Horace Trumbauer to build the extravagant structure in classic English Tudor revival style between 1910 and 1913. Many materials, including the wood paneling, were shipped from Europe, 
and immigrant Italian artisans provided much of the labor. The wealth and ostentation were not lost on the Italian immigrants who had lived under the latifundo in southern Italy. Upon immigration, they found themselves ruled by the dictations of the company-owned camps. Interestingly, about 20 years ago, um, the his a historical society wanted to buy this from the funeral home director and tried to get support in the community. And I heard several Italians say, uh, you know, uh, that was built on the backs of our fathers and I'm not about, and our grandfathers, and I'm not about to support it. So that was, that was some people's reaction. Every family's existence was circumscribed by the daily rhythms that centered on coal production. Work in the mining camps was segregated according to gender. Other industrial regions had work opportunities for women, but the mining regions didn't. Women did not mine coal underground then, and, but nonetheless their labor was central. They performed the arduous tasks of cooking, sewing, gardening, hauling water, washing laundry, cleaning the houses in which everything was covered with coal soot. They also scavenged and bartered, took in borders and laundry, all strategies to extend the family income. Because of social mores, Italian women did not generate income from other means such as cleaning homes, but women also took part in union activities. During all these years, Anna, much like other miners' wives, assumed the role of housewife. With five children now, life on a miner's wages require, required resourcefulness. Work in the mines was sporadic, forcing families to move often in search of steady work. Anna recounted moving to Viropa, Killarm, to Watson, and then finally across the Monongahela to Freeland Street. The Watson Mine was located along the Monongahela River, which divided the Watson Coal Camp from the city of Fairmont. Domenico died of an apparent brain aneurysm while working in the mines during World War II. Anna's marriage could not be described as happy. She told me that she had once commented to Dominic that he had never given her enough money to even buy so much as a cucumber. In San Giovanni, embroidered linens were integral to people's social and economic lives. But in this Anglo community, the embroidery and its cultural symbolism were not relevant. In one sense, Anna became an isolated culture bearer. Although Anna was no longer a part of a tightly knit social group of embroiderers, all types of needlework were done by women in the United States. And so her skills, if not the traditional patterns, were recognized. Needle laces such as crochet were popular. Patterns for undergarments and household items such as doilies were promoted in women's magazines for those who could not afford to purchase them who, who, or who wanted to make them themselves. Crocheted corset covers were an American vogue. Anna became adept at making them for others. She was also commissioned to make crocheted lace that was sewn onto sheets and pillowcases. Around 1930, a San Juanese friend who had emigrated after Anna showed her the Pasolili pattern. Freed from past cultural conventions, Anna put this design to a new use by incorporating it into curtains that neighbors requested. These examples reveal how Anna, always the opportunist, adapted her versatile expertise to the tastes and styles of early 20th century America and through her resourcefulness was able to earn a few dollars for herself. Around 1936, as a gift to her youngest daughter Mary for her trousseau, Anna embroidered one wedding sheet with the traditional San Giovanese Tornise pattern. Although Anna continued to crochet and knit, she did not teach the embroidery to her three daughters. For most of Anna's busy middle years, except for short interludes, the ricamo lay dormant because she neither had the time nor the use for it. The conventions and constraints of time, place, economy, and fashion all affected the usefulness of the traditional embroidery that had been so central to her life in San Giovanni. It took another life-altering event to prompt the art's re-emergence in her life. In 1974, at age 84, Anna made her first and only trip back to Calabria. 
As I said earlier, she'd been gone for 60 years. Her relatives were now living in the city of Cosenza, and she stayed with them during her month-long visit. Here she was reunited with Maria Rosa Aiquinta, a former pupil, who had moved from San Giovanni to Cosenza. Maria Rosa was now teaching Ricamo to her granddaughter. Dependent on her relatives in Cosenza for transportation, Anna made only one trip back to San Giovanni and stayed for just a few hours. When Anna returned, she expressed sadness that she had not thought to arrange to stay in San Giovanni for a few days. Still, it was a momentous reunion with places and people from her past. Her nephew, Salvatore, recalled that it was as if the President of the United States had arrived. All the old women came to greet her, for here was one of their own returning. In San Giovanni, she was reunited with Teresa Biafora, another former pupil. She also met Rosina Iaconis, the expert ricamatrice whom I would interview in 1991. In Anna's recollections of that visit, she is always the protagonist. She is the Maestrina, returning to the adulation of her former students. The actual facts matter little. What is revealing here is how this trip was incorporated into Anna's future accounts. The very nature of the stories, the recollections themselves, point to the transformative nature of the experience. Such reminiscence, a reviewing of memories is, as mentioned earlier, critical to achieving a coherent sense of self. For many elderly, only memory serves this integrative process. But Anna, if only for a few hours, was able to achieve something more. She was physically reunited with her past, with what had become a mythic landscape in her imagination. By revisiting her hometown, experiencing the place, and interacting with people who had lived up to now only in memory, the trip intensified the very need for self-integration because it cast into relief her sense of discontinuity with her past. Upon her return home, Anna set about resolving this disconnection by recreating and reviving the embroidery. Adaptability, resourcefulness, and reinvention had characterized Anna's long life, and she relied on those personal traits once again. Seeing the work still vibrant in San Giovanni, valued by many women who were still doing it, and seeing it preserved in Trousseau, Anna was inspired to begin the work anew. Someone in San Giovanni had given her a hand-loomed piece of old linen. Using it as a model, she practiced recreating the ricamo she had once taught to others. In Number Our Days, Meyer, Barbara Meyerhoff writes about Jacob, a Jewish man who had come from a culture that valued literacy and had written two book-length autobiographies to complete the process of life integration. In Anna's cultural past, Skill with a needle, not a pen, had been the prerogative of women. Up until now, Anna had been weaving her autobiography through tellings and retellings of personal narratives, but these were not tangible records. With a renewed knowledge of the embroidery, Anna recontextualized a material past for her present circumstances, instilling it with new meaning. Like Meyerhoff's Jacob, Anna's approach to aging was complex and dynamic. In old age, Anna continued to bake bread, cook, crochet, and garden, domestic activities that gave her pleasure. She transformed them into gift-giving rituals, effectively cultivating a huge and extended intergenerational network, social network. At age 79, at, in 1979, at age 89, another event affected Anna's life profoundly. Anna decided to undergo surgery to remove her gallbladder because she was in such pain. Her youngest daughter, Mary, pleaded with her not to do it, fearing for her mother's life. But Anna, true to her tenacious personality, said that she didn't care if she died. She was going ahead with it. It saved her life and she would live for another nine years. Afterward, however, because of the operation and her advancing age, she was unable to walk unaided. She was forced to spend her day sitting on the living room couch. For Anna, always undaunted and ever resourceful, the needlework became the sole replacement 
for activities that required more mobility. To quote Meyerhoff again in reference to Jacob's strategies for aging well, Anna set new standards and desires for herself as the old ones became attain unattainable, generating from within appropriate measures of accomplishment and worth. Confined to the couch for the entire day, her body more feeble, but her mind still keen, she practiced Rikamo with a renewed sense of urgency. She set a personal goal to complete one fabric square decorated with needlework per week. The work of life integration was about her past, yet the immediacy of the task at hand kept her in the present and focused on the future. Little could distract her from her work. If something happened to prevent her from finishing her, by her self-imposed deadline, she pronounced herself behind and worked faster to catch up. Unlike representational memory objects that document scenes from an elderly person's life, the embroidery's geometric patterns cannot be easily read. They provide no iconographic clues to Anna's past. Their significance must be deciphered by relying on factors of form, medium, and context. In Anna's revival, she took great fee freedom with traditional conventions. Always innovative, she once again applied the designs for contemporary use. She conceived of making fabric squares that could be used as centerpieces on a table. Each square, approximately 60 by 60 centimeters, was decorated with embroidery patterns and edged with crocheted lace. Anna's standards for judging her work were determined, determined by how quickly she finished a piece rather than solely on its quality. She worked with a large weave synthetic fabric and a fairly thick cotton thread because these were readily available, modestly priced, and easy to handle. She also had failing eyesight, so that was easy. The, well, I, big threat, uh, weave was easy for her to see. When I found linen for Anna, she said she preferred the synthetic fabric that allowed her to quickly pull and cut threads, one of the first steps required before thread is added to fill in the resulting spaces to create designs. The materials Anna chose would have been rejected in San Giovanni, where the fineness of the linen and linen thread and small, expertly executed patterns were most valued. Anna also worked in a larger format than would have been traditional in San Giovanni. For instance, the Chincatielu pattern was ideally one centimeter in width, while Anna's was about two and one half centimeters. By enlarging each individual design, it, took, it lessened the time it would take her to complete a square. This innovation helped her to accomplish her goal, but she still achieved an aesthetically pleasing overall pattern. The repetition of the same few geometric designs that she remembered and the speed of production set to a self-imposed deadline proved viable creative adaptations. Production and reproduction of narrative and artifact interacted, set to the rhythm of the metalwork Anna was accomplishing, the work of life review. Perhaps this very repetition, both of the needle threading in and out of the fabric and that of the designs themselves, functioned as a mnemonic device for memory retrieval, facilitating and accelerating the task at hand. For Anna, the Ricamo was no longer the stored wealth, wealth of the trousseau. Instead, this wealth was to be shared, and true to her nature, she distributed all her work as gifts, first to family members, then to friends, neighbors, and anyone who visited her and admired her work. Anna combined the verbal and visual artistry to construct a coherent sense of, a, and continu, of self and a continuity with her past. Luisa Passarini says that memory insists on creating a history of itself. While self-integration was one task for recalling the past, the act of sharing is another, and that required someone to listen and watch. I was the most willing witness to Anna's urgent need to pass along her memories and her art. In July 1981, I began a six-month apprenticeship to study the Ricamo with Anna and tape record her narratives. Anna took pride in teaching me the art and that she had never transmitted to her own children or grandchildren. 
either because of lack of time on her part or disinterest on theirs. My apprenticeship assured the intergenerational exchange of a cultural legacy that was threatened with the loss of continuity. I wrote in my field notes that, quote, Grandma told me that she was worried that she might get sick and even die before she could teach me. She says now she's not worried anymore because I've learned. In the fall of 1981, Anna demonstrated her needlework at the West Virginia Italian Festival in Clarksburg. As part of a small exhibition I organized to focus on her life and needlework, the festival made a point of recognizing the surviving members of, of the immigrant generation. Anticipating the event, Anna's memory was further stimulated and she remembered patterns she had long ago forgotten. In my field notes I write, wrote that Anna says she remembers another pattern. The next day I recorded, Anna tried out a new pattern she remembered. A few days later, Grandma made another pat new pattern, Agnetola, for the exhibit. In a later entry I recorded, Grandma remembered a new pattern, the chain, which is Schenkethielu. She became the spotlight for a short time at the festival where she and her children basked in the limelight. Local newspaper articles featured her. So she, soon she began teaching another grandchild as well as a woman who had contacted her because of an article in the newspaper. Later that year, an article I wrote about her appeared in the state cultural magazine and it attracted calls and letters. Finally, when a curator from the Smithsonian's National American Museum of American History visited her to collect several pieces of her embroidery for the collection, she felt famous. Through creative adaptation, Anna transformed embroidered lace a significant local means of production in Italy into objects of popular desire in post-immigration America. Her final embroidery experiment creatively bridged the dislocation in space, time, and culture that the immigrant experiences. With geometric inscriptions in lace, Anna succeeded in building, building a tangible tie between herself and future generations. The acknowledgement Anna received from her loved ones in the local community delighted her. And this recognition functioned on a deep level. When the work drew the attention of those analogous in her estimation to Vittorio Emanuela's envoy, it further validated her sense of self and her identity as an immigrant artist. Today, Anna's family members graced their dining room tables with the squares she produced. Her embroideries remain front and center in their homes as tactile and visual reminders of Anna and her cultural legacy. Anna's story bears witness to the role of local knowledge and aesthetic traditions as sources of creativity and meaning in Italian American lives. Let us end where we begin, where we began, with Rosina for another example. Rosina expressed her fear to me that her family, her two sons, and their families would discard all her work when she died. She believed they didn't value it. They certainly couldn't comprehend its emotional hold on her. In fact, when Rosina died in 1993, her fears were realized. I asked a relative living in Canada if she knew what had happened. She reported to me that Rosina's son said, somewhat apologetically, how could they save all that stuff? If the white wear are presentations of the life of feeling, as Armstrong says, of the embroiderers who produced them, or if cloth, to quote Jones and Stolly Breast, materializes memory, then what happens when that material record is forgotten and destroyed? Rosina's family sentiments echoes that of the official record at the Ethnographic Museum in San Giovanni. This museum, dedicated to preserving the material record of the region's social and economic history has collected little of the textile arts, a primary sphere of women's creativity and work. When I spoke with the museum director about the absence of handwork crafted textiles, he lamented about the lack of available um, funds. It is true that textiles present an expensive and a difficult uh, preservation and storage issue. The effect of this omission, however, 
is that the only testimony to the textile arts are a loom, some spindles, two mannequins in costume, and a traditionally dressed bed. No full exploration of women's, women's role in the reproduction of culture exists. The result is a forgetting and erasure, erasure of the part of lived experience, the local knowledge of a people. The museum record, or that lack thereof, brings us to a question Peter Burke has asked. What is the analogy between individual and collective memory and its unofficial suppression or repression. The remembrancer, the role that Peter Burke delegates to the historian, serves us well here. Rather than be the guardian of awkward facts, the skeletons in the cupboard of the social memory, the remembrancer helps broadcast the voices of the disenfranchised, the women whose lives, memories, and art are relegated to the deepest corner of the armoire. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Or if not, we can break up and mingle, and you can come up here. Well, thank you for your attention, and I hope you enjoyed it.